Today's podcast guest has been a professional in many fisheries around the world. Mike Calabrese is joining us to tell us a little bit about the kite fishing sailfish industry of Southern Florida, how it differentiates from trolling in other parts of the world, and what type of teasers we think perform best. There's lots of tasty treats in this episode, you guys, so stay tuned. You're not going to want to miss it. What's up, you guys? Welcome to the Katie C. Sawyer podcast. I'm your host, Katie, and today I'm sitting with Mike Calabrese. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Where are you sitting in from? Hey, Katie. Uh, glad to be here. I am at my home today in uh, Jupiter, Florida, South Florida. Is that where you're from originally? Uh, somewhat. I'm from a little further south, uh, Pompano Beach, Broward County, and uh, my work and stuff on boats had brought me up this way last few years, so... Decided to call Jupiter home. Yep. Jupiter's a really, really pretty place. What's your What's your experience? Like, give us a little bit of rundown of your fishing history, your experience in the field. Oh boy. Okay. So, uh, growing up in South Florida, obviously near the water, fishing was always a thing as a kid. I started out freshwater bass fishing in the canals where I grew up, and then uh, that elevated into my buddy's dad was in a boat rental club. We used to take a boat out and go catch mahi. And then I went to a high school where I met some friends with boats. And that led to uh, some tournament fishing with some friends from high school, which we got pretty good at. And ultimately took up work on boats in my early 20s, kind of undecided as to a career, had a connection on a boat. And the rest is history. Never look back. So your fishing, um, your fishing was predominantly Southern Florida for a good chunk of your early years, correct? Or your early in the industry years? Yep, that's right. I worked for a program that we pretty much did South Florida kite fishing, and then we'd go to Key West a lot, but mostly Florida before a new job and taking on some travel in my mid-20s after the first job I had, which was mostly South Florida-based, correct? And where did you go uh, once you started traveling? After the first job, I Went to school to get my captain's license. I uh, met a fellow there who was also a fisherman. We became friends in class. After this class, uh, he reached out, asked me if I wanted to help deliver a boat from Stewart to Panama, I believe. I had nothing else going on. I said, sure, let's do it. Met a captain there. It was an American custom yacht. Had a good trip. Ended up going back for another delivery, which brought me from uh, Costa Rica to Cabo San Lucas, where I ended up meeting another boat that was in need of a crew crewman, and that was a boat called the Patriot, a big 80-foot Monterey, Captain Terry Stansel and his wife Bonnie, and the timing was right there. I met them in Cabo San Lucas and uh, came back a little while later to start my, my, my work there for several years. I worked on the Patriot. That was a great learning experience, great program, fished the Gulf of Mexico, and then eventually we towed the boat with a mothership across the Pacific down to uh, Tahiti, onto the kingdom of Tonga and then New Zealand was the, That's was the so distance cool. of that travel. That's was amazing. A very okay. Outstanding trip, yeah. So when did you start in uh Cabo with Patriot? What like what year? That would have been probably around two thousand and five, six. And so yep. were you what were you fishing there? Were you fishing like the finger bank? Gordo? What were you fishing in Cabo? I had missed the big striped marlin season there, up 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 the way there at Mag Bay. Um, they had they had done it previously before I got there. I was actually there for a little while, and then we brought the boat back to the Gulf of Mexico that summer. Uh, we caught some striped marlin out front, but uh, never the big number stuff that folks are seeing now. Was that your first exposure to like marlin fishing? Uh, somewhat. I did have a stint with a friend of mine who uh, family had a boat. And I second mated that uh, in St. Thomas for a season, which was another great learning experience, blue marlin fishing in St. Thomas. Uh, but other than that, yeah, I had minimal minimal marlin experience until that point. So the St. Thomas marlin fishery is pretty, I, I've never done it myself, but it's it's like, I don't want to say rat blues, but like small blue marlin, correct? Like kind of similar to Costa Rica uh, or am I off? No, St. Thomas is actually known for bigger Average quality size fish, uh, probably 250 to 500 is, you okay. know, but the, uh, it gets a little rougher there. The fish are angry there. They're very aggressive. Good average size fish, probably average three plus and uh, aggressive, good teaser bites. And people love it there for the, 
the angry fish. What's the season in St. Thomas? Uh, it would be probably starting in June, but it seems, you know, a little later, uh, the best times I would say would be August, September, October, perhaps lately. Nice. Late Super summer. Cool. Mm -hmm. So, um, man, I, I hadn't realized that you, you were towed on a mothership across the Pacific ocean. That's, that's a story for another time. I like, I'm going to, I'm going to try not yeah. to focus on that because I have a million yep. other questions oh, I want to ask you, but you kind of, you caught me off guard. You blew me away there a little bit, but, um, okay, cool. So growing up in South Florida, you were doing the, now you mentioned the kite fishing. That's something that I actually didn't know even was a thing until well after I had started kite fishing for yellowfin tuna in the Pacific with artificial. And I, I came in, this is for the listener. I came into, um, back to the, the Gulf of Mexico and was starting to work with an organization that had me in South, South Florida for a little while. And I called Mike up and I was like, Hey, I need to understand this kite fishing industry. Like, why are we, why are we flying kites for sailfish? And why only here? So, Mike, can you give us some some insight on that? Yeah. So, I mean, I certainly didn't invent it or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> I guess down in Miami in the 1950s or so, uh, a fella figured out how to build and fly a kite and uh, dangle some baits from it with release clips. Basically, in South Florida, it's kind of a function of our geography. We have a very uh, steep drop off off the coast. It drops off pretty quick. Therefore, the lane that the fish tend to hang out and travel in is quite narrow. So, for example, uh, typical sailfish depth here, a lot of places, one call it 100 to 200 feet of water. As you get down to South Florida, it's a fairly tightly compressed lane. With that being said, trolling can be difficult to stay in that area, to maximize your fishing in that lane. This fella, uh, I know Bob Lewis is one of the first guys to build a kite or those are the first kites from Miami there, but, um, great idea. And, and what it does is it enables you to almost like an outrigger get, get multiple baits away from the boat and also fish them on the surface of the water where sailfish like to come up and feed. And it's very visual. You get to see the bite often and, and it's a fun way to fish and it's uh it's pretty efficient. Yeah. It's a fun way to fish. That's cool. So what you guys are doing is you're using the kites to put the baits in a very specific area because there's only a small um, surface area where these fish are most likely going to be congregating and feeding. Right. So, you know, th that's the, the thing about any fishing is you never exactly know where the fish are going to be as far as depth of water location. Um, but basically we'll take the, the wind direction into, you know, wind direction combined with current and that's where you did how you decide to where you're going to put your boat and how your kites are going to angle behind the boat and what depth of water they're going to be in. So we'll fish two kites. Typically you can do more. Some people fish three, but we'll take two kites and we'll, those are each on their own kite rod, which is an electric rod short, like a teaser rod. And that has, you know, braided kite line on there and clips that catch as the kite goes out. And typically we'll fish three rods per kite. We'll take little split shot sinkers and we'll weight the kites in the corners to kick them either left or right. And once again, depending on the wind direction, how much, how much kick or bank do you need to, essentially we're making a fence uh, for these fish that are migrating south at the same time as the boats drifting north, we're almost intercepting schools of fish and your three kite baits are designed as, you know, you basically want to cover as much ground as possible to cut off these fish moving south as your boat moves north, typically. So how, how do you uh, have, how do you, if you have one kite and three baits from each kite, how do you keep your baits separated? Because they're live baits, right? Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So uh, the clips are distanced apart. So a standard setup is you'll, you'll let your kite out, clip your kite on, let it out. About 100 feet comes your first clip, which will be your long. Now, the kite rods are outboard typically in the, in the covering board of the boat or in the wings outboard. And then you have your rocket launcher or whatever inside, and that will hold your rods. So you're, you'll have three rods on the right side, and the furthest inside is your long. 
then middle, then short would be closest to the kite rod. And it's important just to keep those in order as you let your kite out and fish, bring your kite in, those rods all stay in order. So when you do get a fish on and you pop out of the clip and you have to, you know, get tight to your fish, you're not tangling with the other ones. So those, those baits are spaced out on the kite line. The kite's about 100 feet from the first clip and then we 65, 75 feet apart are the clips. And that, that's what keeps your baits apart hanging there in the water. Yeah. So if you get a fish is when it gets tricky, you know, having to pop out of the clip and then lift. Oftentimes you have to lift up the other baits out of the water so your fish in line can pass underneath as you get tight to your fish. So Man, so how many anglers do you have generally? Do you have one per rod, one per bait, or do you in have In a perfect to... world, yes. Um, yeah, just like trolling. I mean, the more people holding rods, the better because, you know, just like trolling, if you can – see the bite coming or, you know, you're in free spool, obviously with your thumb on the reel, anticipating the bite, you're ahead of the game. You got a better chance at hooking your fish and feeding the fish without it feeling anything weird. Um, Cause those selfish, those selfish in South Florida aren't, aren't very big. My, most of my selfish experiences in the Pacific and they're quite a bit bigger than they are in the Atlantic. So how, how much are these fish weighing approximately? Yeah. Um, I'd say the average fish is probably around 40 pounds. I mean, they're, they're, they are, you know, they vary in size. Some, some days they run bigger. Some days you notice they're a little smaller, but I will say, you know, where they might not be as big as the Pacific sailfish, they, they do fight quite a bit harder. They're a little, you know, they can, they tend to go deeper on you during the battle sometimes, um, change directions very crazily. They're, they're wild fish and there's no telling, you know, one minute they could be jumping, out here to the left and then the next minute they're 200 feet over that way and you got a big belly <laughs> in your line uh trolling you know once again like in the pacific there you hook a fish put the boat in a turn they tend to stay in the middle of the circle you know of your turn mm -hmm. hooking a fish on a kite there's no telling where it's going to go sometimes so it's it can be a little tricky with all those baits in the water uh, hanging also the boat spins to go catch the fish and now you got kites wrapping around your tower with your baits are off your bow. Sometimes you get a bite while your baits are off the bow, uh, catching another fish, but it's, it's, it's a very much a team effort. Um, and the more people you have that are competent and helpful, the better you're going to do, you know, just like trolling. Yeah. All the more uh, reason to have somebody on every single rod, every single line. Absolutely. Yeah. Paying um, attention, watching your baits, you know, we have uh, the, the floats or markers that we fish kite fishing. Uh, a lot of the trolling guys make fun of them, call them bobbers, but uh, it's a pink <laughs> styrofoam float, which is a, it's a visual indicator for us on the boat. You know, that your long bait might be 250 feet away from you or something, but, uh, you know, it's hard to see your bait in the water. Plus, you, you want your bait a little underwater. You don't always see your bait. We're actually watching our, uh, our pink styrofoam floats, which are at the top of our 15-foot leaders, so... Uh, those we're trying to keep above the water. And when you, when you do get a nervous bait or a bite happening, that thing kind of starts to show, you know, some funny activity and I might be getting a bite here. My bait's nervous. So, uh, we're staring at pink, so cool. pink floats all day long, basically. <laughs> we, uh, yeah. I mean, when we were fishing, fishing kites, we'd have just one kite. Well, I mean, one kite and then one artificial on it. And we'd have to tie like a fluorescent ribbon to it just mm -hmm. to have an idea of where the heck that was. Because yeah. you just, if you're doing your job right, you can't see your line and you can't see your bait. So, That's right. um, yeah. the, I had a question, but I, I'm going to, I'm going to go real quick fishing for the Pacific sales with so much experience fishing for Pacific as well as South Florida, the smaller ones. Do you find that there's a difference in the bite? Like are the smaller sailfish more finicky when they eat? Um, it depends. Um, some days, and, and you know, I don't think any fisherman completely knows the answer to this. You know, you have people talk about the moon, the tide, you know, this, that, and the other thing. We like to make excuses, let's say, when things don't work out. But uh, I will say that you tend to get uh, more aggression out of fish when they're traveling in, in a pack. So, for example, if you get a really aggressive bite, it's, a, it's an indication that there might be more fish with that fish because of the, the competition factor. Uh, you know, typically lazy. Sometimes sometimes these sailfish are extremely finicky, fussy. 
you know, they could come up and look at your bait. We call it window shoppers because on a kite, you're sitting still. You're able to actually kind of sit there and watch it all happen. And sometimes a fish will come up and eyeball your bait, swim a circle around it, you know, just and swim off like it, it's not interested. And for whatever reason, you know, it happens. And uh, other days they're chewing the paint off the boat. So it's just you just got to go to know, I say, and, uh, you know. Some, sometimes it could be, it could be the bait. You know, we, we, we often think, you know, we always carry different kinds of bait. Um, a few different staple species of bait that tournament boats are going to go with. You know, if you had that happen to you, sometimes you say, Oh, maybe he didn't want my, my goggle eye. Maybe he wanted a herring, but who knows, you know, we don't, they don't talk to us, but, uh, all you can do is take that information and try to, you know, if you got to change your bait for the next one or something, but, um, they are, fin they can be very finicky, especially in certain weather conditions. Um, you know, weather, I, I call them weather fish down here. They're extremely, you know, they're, ex they're they, their feeding is a lot based upon weather, cold fronts. I can elaborate on that. Yeah. Yeah. How so? Tell me more. Um, in South Florida, we're always, in the winter time is sailfish time and, when the wind, we get cold fronts, north wind, cold temperatures is typically when you get the fish biting. I believe it has to do with the colder water temperatures of the north, pushing them down. Then they start to fight the current of the water. They're traveling south. They're stemming the current. They got to use more energy to swim that, to swim south. Uh, with that cold weather comes north wind, which makes big waves against the current. So when that happens, just last week, we can get into this, but we had a big event here. We had finally got a couple of real strong cold fronts where we got down in the in the 40s for South Florida. It was real cold. And the Whoa. fish finally showed up. And uh, so when it gets real good like that, they get to biting, they get to moving, um, tailing sailfish, which I'm sure you've seen in Cabo San Lucas or the striped marlin, but... Uh, you know, when the waves direction gets right, they'll pop up on the surface and, and try to catch a ride with the waves. And that's when uh, the really big numbers come through in Miami last week, you know, 60 fish, tailing that's fish, crazy. people, people riding around in their towers. And it's super fun. You know, once again, a lot of people might downgrade or denigrate the spinning rod. However, it's a fun way to fish, uh, sight fishing, casting at uh, tailing sailfish. Um, nice. But other than that, yeah, the weather, the weather, they like cold, they like the cold snaps here in South Florida for sure. That's awesome. Gets and going. I like that theory behind it too. The, um, so are y'all flying kites as well as sight casting when that happens? Yeah. Depending upon, uh, how many are tailing. Uh, if you're flying kites, you're pointed into the wind anyhow, into the sea. So the captain or another guy can typically look for fish while the rest of the crew is fishing out the back with the kites. Eyes are ahead on the water looking for fish that are going to be coming by the boat where you can also, you can catch them while you're kite fishing. Oftentimes you'll see a tailor, they'll fade out and then they'll pop up on your kite baits. You know, you, once again, the kite baits kind of cut them off uh, on their route. So yeah, but sometimes they'll swim right by the boat too. We had uh yeah. We had a, like a, a school of about eight fish the other day that we could we never got a bite. You know, they just faded underneath the boat and didn't pop up on us, which is unfortunate. How frustrating, but, uh, especially with their very frustrating. Eight of them. Yeah, That's crazy. it's uh, yep. Yeah, and we were kite fishing, and we were hoping they would they would pop up on the baits. Um, just didn't happen there. But it, yeah, it's it's kind of a helpless feeling when something like that happens. Or you know, same thing if you cast. Sometimes you could you could hit a perfect cast on these fish or whatever, and they just still don't want to eat it for whatever reason, and you know, on to the next <laughs> Knock one. Knock them on the head yeah, a bit. They're not they all. Eat it. Maybe they were caught. Maybe they were. Who knows? You know, but not interested. I want to get into the bait culture, but before we do that, can you tell me a little bit about this fishing zone? So you already said there's a there's a narrow alley in which these fish are migrating in the southern side of Florida. And you're setting up, from what I understand, you set up a drift and you set your kites out and then you drift down sea while fishing for these fish. And how, like, how long is that drift? Like, how many miles is this fishing zone that y'all generally target? 
Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so it you could drift depending on the wind direction. Obviously, if you have an east wind, you're going to be getting, you know, the, the waves are going to want to push you shallower. It's all about staying in that depth that the captain feels are your best chances. You know, naturally, sailfish they can be in 100 feet of water, they can be in 200 feet of water, they can be in 300 feet of water, you know, anywhere really. But the captain puts the boat where he thinks they're going to be. Um, typically, we have north current, which means the water is moving south to north and your boat will be moving north. Now you could, you know, depending on the action, you can ride it out as long as you want. If you're, if you're in the, the depth that makes you happy, uh, oftentimes you'll catch fish and then the captain will run back and get south again to try to come back over that same stretch of water or even go further south to try to re-intercept that body of fish that just came through. So that's, that's really the only, you know, the way you have to look at it is that these fish are moving north to south, or even if they're holding their, their ground on a piece of bottom or bait, the water is moving north. So, you know, that's, that's the million dollar question is when to move, when to reset, when to run back, how far to run back, you know, how deep all that stuff is the, is the, is the real, the real stuff that, that separates the winners from the losers. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a huge tournament culture in South Florida. So when you, you've got these big events going on, how many boats are fishing this pretty small area? Yeah, so I think I think most tournaments these days, about 50 boats, give or take. Um, and then the tournaments have boundaries. Some tournaments are based out of a certain inlet. For example, let's say the tournament's out of Palm Beach. They might make the boundary... 30 miles in each direction. So you have a 60 mile fishing range. Uh, other tournaments, we have one coming up soon here called the Jimmy Johnson. We also just had one called the Sailfish Challenge. It was a big boundary format to whereas boats can choose any inlet they want to fish out of. For example, if, if you're from Miami, you know, you can fish down there or from Palm Beach, you can fish up here, uh, wherever you want to fish, which adds a challenge to it because the days leading up to it is, you know, everybody's wondering where the fish are, where's the best fishing, uh, boats making last minute moves from Miami to Palm Beach, you know, the night before it's all common, um, and vice versa. Uh, it's very important to keep your ear to the ground and, and communicate with other fishermen about what they saw, what they call it conditions. But yeah, the I mean, you know, last week it was, they were biting from Stewart to Key Largo and, uh, ah. You could, you could, you could, yeah, the best fishing was down there south of, you know, Ocean Reef. However, there was boats catching 30 fish uh, out here at Jupiter. And um, there was a tournament a couple days later and everybody was thinking Miami was going to be the spot. And it ended up being uh, to the north was where the tournament was won up here. So you have to be fluid. You have to be able to adapt and adjust to the, the ever-changing fishery we have, which changes overnight. Unfortunately, you know, because we have the Gulf Stream and the water's essentially flying by our coast here, which means d different bodies of water coming in and going, you know, frequently. And, uh, With different gotta, nutrients in it, different That's levels right. yeah. of, of uh, float zone sure. and all of that. Yeah. Now, just, current water temp, all of it. Just yesterday, or yeah, fished a two day tournament. The first day, the water, we saw tons of man wars. There was, the probably some of the most I've ever seen in my life, hundreds. And they were actually grabbing, they would grab your kite baits. If, if they drifted too closely, you'd have to lift your bait because these man wars would find them and get them. And, um, anyhow, How saw a pile of them on Friday. Yesterday we go out there and hardly didn't see as many. There was not nearly as many. The water color was different. You know, it's, it changes and you gotta, you gotta react and adapt, you know, but, and it's all, it's all part of the challenge. Be, yeah. Yeah. All the more reason to be fishing consistently during the season to stay competitive. For sure. Right? Yeah. Yeah. What's that? So the bait, the bait culture down there bait. is pretty specific. <laughs> oh, yeah. People are um, fanatical you, about bait, for sure. It's well, very important. And, and, which makes sense. But um, you mentioned herring, goggle eye, 
what uh what's your favorite kind of bait what do you make sure you have and how do you make sure that your bait is healthiest for your your tournament your tournaments or your fun fishing yeah so uh basically there's three main baits you got the goggle eyes threadfin herring or greenies looks like a big pilchard or something almost like a tarpon baby uh baby tarpon and then uh spanish sardines which are probably the most sought after bait the sardines however they also tend to get bit up a lot by bonitas and other critters so goggle eyes are the, are the main staple source of bait here uh the thing about goggle eyes is you got to they, they're caught at night so um most people end up buying bait from bait guys that go out and do it at night very hard to obtain goggle eyes sometimes uh a lot of times the bait guys, even in Palm Beach, will trailer their boats all the way to the Keys to catch them in abundance so they can, you know, have it, have enough to make it worthwhile to, to do it. So anyhow, goggle eyes, shoot, lately they've been upwards of $200 a dozen here in Palm Beach, uh, which is Dang. crazy. Yeah. yeah. It's, it used to be, I remember growing up, it was $40 a dozen and $20 a dozen for pilchards. Now you're, you're looking at... Uh, it was up to 120 for gogs. And then during tournament season, they've been tough to catch lately. The prices are around $200 a dozen for these things. Um, and those baits, the goggle eye is good because it's a hardy bait. It's typically a little bigger, um, probably, you know, eight inches or so. And they're strong. They're a great bait for your long kite baits, uh, which is the furthest one from the boat. It's got the most uh, wind effect on that kite bait blowing your your line in the air so you want to on your long bait typically you want a big hardy bait goggle eyes are known for just kicking their tails off and being putting out good vibes and strong you know strong vibrations and splashing so uh definitely goggle eyes if there's only one bait you could have it'd probably be a goggle eye um lately we've also had access to threadfin herrings which are like i said like a big pilcher greenies uh those are all over the place too, from Costa Rica to Louisiana, obviously in Texas, I'm sure. Um, those are great sailfish baits. We call them scale baits. Uh, definitely more fragile, a little more sensitive to, you know, when you bridle your bait, you got to be more careful with the scale baits. You don't want to knock the scales off of them. So there's that fine line of, you know, how hard you can grip your bait versus squeezing it to death to, you know, put a needle through it and, and sew it on. But that's all part of the part of it is to uh, keep your baits as nice and healthy as possible when you get them in the water. Um, with that being said, also people people will obtain their bait early on and they will pen it up. Uh, we have we make bait pens. Sometimes they're plastic round floating wells. Sometimes we have cages that we sink for goggle eyes, and then you have, we feed our baits. Um, they have pellet food. Some people I've seen people have uh, timers with the, with the automatic fish feeders. So they, you know, if they're not there, if they're not there one day, their bait's still going to get fed or whatever. Of course, if you can get some fresh scraps of bonitas or anything like that, it's always good to feed your bait. So just like any, any living thing, you know, the better their diet is, the better, the more healthy they're going to be. And uh, when you put them out there on the, on the hook, hopefully they're the going to last gonna long perform. and splash around. Yep healthy yeah, bait, strong make a bait. scene. Mm -hmm. Bite. Make so that, a that's, scene. yeah. I mean, the, the best boats, they they typically will have their bait a long time ahead of a tournament. They'll have it all fed up and seasoned and, uh, you know, keep accurate quantities of, of what they got, how many they bring each day. Uh, because it's, it's, it's a grind to catch bait and to, to keep it. It's, it's at least half the battle in this thing for sure is, uh, having good bait. Ultimately, you got to be in the right place, in my opinion. Uh, there's no substitute for being on top of the fish. But yes, bait is is important for sure. Didn't Just like trolling, you know, when you're when you're doing your ballyhoos and you're prepping your ballyhoos, and you know, if some of them the head breaks and you got a batch where they're weak. You know, you say, shoot, you know, um, this isn't good. Your color on the tape, you know, you want your you want to put your best bait forward for sure. In any fishing, when you're when the when these guys are feeding their baits, uh, bonita fish, something that's 
going to give them a, a healthier appeal because it's what they're eating kind of in the wild, right? They get that same nutrients. Didn't you tell me that they have like their own like dock bait blenders and how does that process work? Yeah, I mean, it not you know, it depends on everybody has their own way of doing things. I personally bought, have a blender in my dock box that I'll uh, when I catch bonitas, I'll I cut bonita strips. I'll save those for wahoo fishing, planer fishing. But you can take the meat and it's you know it's that good red meat and it's uh, got a lot of good nutrients, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, I'll take that. I'll I'll blend it up with salt water, and you know to me that's easier than just cutting it. You know we're trying to make life as easy as possible to some degree. But uh, yeah, the blender works well for me. Blend up some scrap meats. Even if you got, you know, we'll save like the roe from mahis, uh, the roe. Nice. Any kind of scrap meat is good, good fresh food for the fish. And uh, yeah, they'll eat it. That's a great way to use all sides of the fish that you're catching and put it back into the sport recreationally. Yeah. I love that. Um, it's all work and, and, and ultimately the hard work hopefully will pay off for you. It doesn't always, but, um, you know, having good bait is, so it's one of the things we can control. So we're going to, we're going to put, you know, we're going to do it. What about the sardines? You, you spoke a little bit about the scales, the, um, the goggle eyes, and then what mm -hmm. about the sardines? Sardines are great. Uh, we've had definitely had some of our best fishing, Typically to the south in the Florida Keys, or if the, if the fish are tailing, a sardine is a great bait to cast at a fish because of they, they'll stay on the surface when they hit the water, as opposed to like a goggle eye will want to swim down. Swim down. But sardines are just, they're very elusive. They're very hard to obtain. People will go great distances to try to catch them and have them in their arsenal. And like I said, uh, it's a great bait. Some there have been tournaments won on sardines, indeed, but I haven't I haven't had sardines this year. Uh, up north here in Palm Beach and stuff, it seems like a goggle eye is, is a great bait. But when you get down towards the Keys there and Ocean Reef, you know there's somewhat better habit. We can catch sardines here too, certain times of year. In the summer, they're all over the place in Jupiter. It's all you want. Uh, this time of year, they're they're not around. Yeah, so. Some boats, like I said, they'll travel, you know, the programs that do this full time, they'll go, they'll have their bait boat, they'll have a center console. If they have a sport fish boat, they'll have a secondary center console that they'll go run around in, you know, leave out of Fort Lauderdale, run to Miami or beyond to catch sardines, bring them back, pen them up for a month before the tournament, you know. That's how, that's the extent people will go to have sardines. And, and, you know, whether they pay or not, time only can only tell. Um, there's been times, you know, we used to fish a lot in Key West and, and a sailfish tournament in Key West. And we would spend so much time ch catching sardines before the tournament. Even on a, there was a lay day, we'd fish, you know, we'd fish three days in a row and then have a lay day. And we'd be, we'd go run 60 miles to catch sardines on a lay day. And sometimes we'd only catch a dozen, you know, and a lot of it, a lot of effort into that. And sometimes, you know. In hindsight, it's like, oh, maybe we didn't need them, or maybe we didn't need to do that. But, you know, once again, if you can control something and you make the effort to try to do it to have the, the right bait, you know. But, uh, yeah, so the sardines, definitely one of the sailfish's favorite food because if you go down there to, like, Isla Mujeres, Mexico, which is also in the Atlantic or the Caribbean here, same fish, essentially. They're there feasting on sardines. That's, that's the predominant bait that, that brings the sailfish to that area, uh, massive schools of sardines and cigar minnows, but sailfish love them. It's, I would say it's like they're probably one of their favorite natural foods to eat. For Man, sure. that's so cool. Yeah. Okay. I have a question for you because, um, and I want to make sure I understand this correctly. So the Isla season is December, January, February, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty much. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And then we have the um, South Florida season that's February, March, April. Lately, yes. Uh, you know, in the past, uh, to tournaments used to start in October, November, and they still do some of them. But for whatever reason, the season seems to have been shifting later on here. Uh, the last few years, the best bite has occurred in towards the end of February, early March. Um, 
maybe it's just when the water temperatures finally get cool enough to the north where the fish have to come down at that point. Um, yeah, so that's my question. So how are those, if those fish are moving north to south, but the season is earlier in Isla, how is that working? Like, are they, are they going up? Are they going north and then coming back down? Like, are they circulating? Do we know what those fish are doing? I don't Do you think we know. My I think I, I think it's it? <laughs> no, no. It's a great question. I mean, it's it's the million dollar question once again. That even the even the, the wealthiest of people and best fishermen don't have the the answers to. Um, but I I would say those are different bodies of fish. I feel like those fish down in the Yucatan area, they probably spend their their you know majority of their time down that way somewhere, perhaps into the Gulf of Mexico and the Campeche the or whatever. Gulf, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Like the rest of the year, um, wherever the sardines probably go is where they go. They go. Um, but yeah, I don't, I mean, there's been tags. I don't know if the billfish foundation has ever had a tag, uh, return from Mexico to South Florida or vice versa. How I'm sure it's happened, but, we'll um, ask. yeah, I, you know, and it also that you get fish off the Carolinas and, uh, like, you know, South Carolina had great sail fishing, I think in maybe like October or September this year, late season, you know, great sail fishing for them up North of us here. Uh, so I, I think we're seeing, I think the U S has, you know, an East coast population of sailfish and then perhaps the ones down there in the Yucatan are different fish, I would say. Yeah. The not, ones not, uh, yeah. we we get a general like a pretty good sailfish bite sometimes in the southern Gulf of Mexico out of South mm-hmm. Texas. Uh, yeah. I want to say late July, August, September it can get it can get pretty good. So mm-hmm. that's re- uh, that's really interesting. Yeah, I didn't know it if could that's be those fish that we know. <laughs> or... I don't think anybody does. I think it's it's yeah it's you know scientists that study the water the water uh, you know. Plankton, chlorophyll, temperature, those, those factors are probably what, where, where they are, you know. Because I think it's interesting that your speculation, your hypothesis is that they're two different bodies of fish because from what I do understand is that sailfish, they don't really go very far from what we know on tagging data and tagging research. Right. So, right? Yeah, so, I mean, I would think so. I, yeah. 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 Um, that's, that's super interesting. Or as opposed to like blue marlin, which are, which have crossed the ocean, they, they like cross ocean basins, not as much as bluefin tuna or as regularly right. as bluefin tuna, but, um, they're all considered highly migratory species, but their migration vary. And I think that it's interesting that these fish are s- so small. The sailfish are the fa- I mean, I believe is the fastest fish in the ocean, right? I think that's what they say. And it makes sense. You know, based upon their size of their tail, with the, their how thin they are and their their mass, you know, they're thinner than a marlin, so they probably slide through the water a lot easier. I'd say so. Uh, yeah, they're they're neat. They're crazy when you hook one, especially you know, kite fishing, trolling, whatever, however you hook it. But uh, well, like I said, they could be out here to the left a couple hundred feet, and then next minute they're gone the other way, and you got a big belly in your line and jumping all over the it, ocean. It kind of reminds me of the difference between a big blue marlin and a little blue marlin. Like those little blues, they'll just, they, they're they so agile. They've got all that yep. s- just spunk of a marlin, but with a lot more yeah. agility. Yeah. Um. So I want to go a little bit into trolling. Am I wrong when I say that from what I understand, north of Stewart, Florida, your fishing teams start trolling instead of kite fishing. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's pretty, pretty accurate. Um, there's some boats that'll go. So if you look at Florida on a map or a chart, you know, Palm beach is where north of Palm beach is where our coastline starts to jog off to the West, to the Northwest. However, the shelf pretty much continues straight North. So with that being said, uh, Palm beach is very close to get to a hundred feet of water. You're looking at, you know, whatever, a mile, let's call it. Uh, Jupiter here a little north, about 10 miles north of Palm Beach, you got to go about three miles because of the, you know, the, the coast starts to, to jog northwest there. Stewart, you're going further, you know, five, six miles. And then uh, Fort Pierce, you know, even further. So anyhow, 
the, the, the shelf broadens the further north you go. There's more area where the fish can be. Um, Palm Beach and South, very compressed, very narrow lane of 100 to 200 feet of water. Up that way, Stewart, Fort Peterson North, spread out. Fish can be, you know, all over the place. You're, a lot of habitat, potential habitat. So guys, you know, they troll for them because uh, they can cover ground. And it's also his historical tradition. It's how they were raised doing it. Um, I will say now you're seeing a few more guys out of Stewart starting to kite fish. They're realizing that it's quite effective. It's a little bit more relaxing way to fish. If you have, let's say you have a charter or guests on the boat that are, you know, you're, you're, you're essentially kind of sitting still. Um, it's, it's a little more enjoyable in that you don't have to hold the reel. You know, you're not holding the, the pressure of the bait, dragging it seven, eight knots along or whatever on your thumb. You know, it, it's, you're sitting still and you're watching your baits. And, um, but yeah, the trolling thing is essentially due to the geography, I'd say, up further north there. The guy's got to cover more ground and uh, yeah, but you're seeing more guys starting to kite fish out up that way too now. I find it interesting that the kite fishing is starting to kind of spread up, up that Northern area. Uh, there That's people are realizing, you know, why not, why not make my life easier and, and, and catch more fish for my clients, if you will. You know, I mean, I heard a guy. So long a as steward, getting live bait is not an issue. <laughs> correct. Correct. Yeah. And it, it can be an issue. Uh, Stewart typically has good bait uh, availability. They have a lot of those threadfin greenies up there, you know, boats, they can go out and catch them in the morning on their way out. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, especially if you got a three or four foot sea, you know, your kite fishing is going to be more comfortable as well for folks that aren't, you know, if they're, if they're chartering a boat or something like that, it's, it's, it's more comfortable, more productive, better chance of hooking a fish basically being that it's a live bait that they're, you know, you're not, the boat's not moving forward. It's, it's, it's easier in some regards. Ah, that's interesting. It's also yeah, more, it's also challenging in other ways as well compared to trolling. Um, but like I said, I heard, I heard a Stuart captain on the radio the other day, uh, talking about how he, man, I can't believe we just figured this kite thing out, you know, lately here. It's can't believe we haven't been doing it longer. It's what, what a pleasure it was. It is to fish Aww. kites. That's so. super cool. Yeah. Okay. I mean, That's new. Interesting. Well, um, I feel like people, yeah, I feel like a lot of guys disparage it because they don't know how to do it. Um, and, and it's a fear thing, you know, but mm -hmm. the reality is I feel like if you want to be a good fisherman, you should be good at all types of fishing. And, uh, exactly. Yeah. And try, try it. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe you don't like it. Maybe it doesn't work for you. Maybe you have a different theory elsewhere, but you're never going to actually know if you don't give it a go. I think the hard thing, so, one of the hard things with kite fishing, sorry to interrupt, is that, uh, yeah, you're good. you know, all, all three of your lines are on the one, on the kite line. So let's say your long bait gets a bite. Let's say you get a, a kingfish, chops your bait in half. Mm -hmm. Now you got to bring in all three rods to change that one bait. So if you're, if you're a mate, if you're, if you're the only mate in the cockpit, kite fishing can be a nightmare because you're just, you're not, you're not, it takes hands, it takes help. If you got a good crew and some good help, it's all good. Um, you know, trolling, you get a bite, you're just dealing with that one rod, reel it in, put a new bait on, send it back out. Kite fishing, you got to bring the kite in, bring all three rods in, you know, there's ways to work around that. But if, if you're shorthanded, it can be an absolute nightmare, especially if you got a lot of critters biting, bonitas, kingfish, whatever. What about you know, grass? You need help. Is that an issue? Seaweed as well. Absolutely. Yeah. You can get bait, uh, grass on your bait. And then if you can't get it off, you got to start over again. It's a pain. That is sure. a pain. Seaweed's yeah. always a pain, no matter what. But so I will say I, I like seaweed for fishing because, uh, you know, lately we have, haven't seen much seaweed all winter long. Now there's a little bit of scattered grass in town and the sailfish are here. I think it's got something to do with the whole, the whole basis of the food chain, the seaweed for sure. Plankton. Uh, yeah. It starts, it starts with the plankton and, and that, and then it, and bait and, uh, Sailfish follow. Attracting the bigger fish. That's right. Wow, that yeah. makes me happy to hear that. Are Is the seaweed you're seeing, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Is it all condensed? Is it all sitting together? Is it floating together? Is it pretty spread out? It's, it's scattered grass, as we mm -hmm. call it. You know, it's live, the bright live sargasm weed, which is a good indicator as well that it's alive. Um, saw those man of wars. Um, yeah, it's, it's little small clumps. And I've noticed it. 
anywhere I fish, you know, up to Ocean City, Maryland, all that, when you're getting bit, you, you know, you're trying to figure out where, you know, what, is there anything to it? And uh, oftentimes I'll notice bits of seaweed in the water. A good thing, probably. So you feel like when you're, you feel like when, in your experience, when you're seeing pretty consistent seaweed, you're seeing more bites. It depends, I, I guess. Did I'm, I I'm sur- not... surmise that correctly? <laughs> It, it all depends. I mean, in the summertime here, sometimes we get giant clumps and mats of seaweed. You know, you can walk on it. That I don't want to fish in. You know, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, it seems to be when you got that good live water with flying fish and, you know, whatever the bait, whatever the plankton source is. But, uh, you know, it's almost, I just, I just noticed the other day we were catching sailfish and there's little bits of little small pieces of, of scattered grass around. And I've, cool. I said, man, I've seen this before when we've been getting bit. I've seen this before. So that's just how I is that, think. Is that blue water what you're looking for too? Like, is it, do you see a difference in the water clarity down there or uh, over there? Yeah. I mean, definitely, <laughs> definitely water and color is a thing. However, just when you think you got that figured out, mm-hmm. you know, the sailfish will spin it up on you. Uh, last week, the water was quite greenish. It was, it was green, blue, green, but more green and blue. And they were snapping in it, you know, and, uh, when it was more about the weather those days, it was, we were, it got very cold, you know, here in South Florida, that's what it takes to get the fish going is that cold, cold Snap. weather. Yeah. How cool. Yeah. That's a nice little nugget of information right there. So I, I want saying, to get a little bit into, <laughs> into trolling, troll fishing. Um, uh-huh. if the listener doesn't know anything about trolling and, uh, I think you did a great job explaining the kites. Can you give us just a little synopsis on what trolling is and, um, what parts of the world do that? Yeah. Yeah. Trolling, uh, probably the most popular way to fish, obviously, uh, throughout the world. Um, and, and the last few years guys have gotten to kind of going more to bait as opposed to lures, obviously big Marlin guys still. We'll pull artificial lures for blue marlin with J hooks. Um, but what we're seeing is everybody essentially fishing the same spread, essentially, which is swimming ballyhoo, chin weighted, circle hooks, uh, light, light tackle, lighter leaders, um, you know, dredges, squid chain teasers. And then from there, you can, uh, you know, customize, you know, everybody's got their own little things of what color squid chain or what color islanders on the dredge or whatever. I think you just got to drive over the fish personally, but, uh, um, yeah, trolling, trolling is a thing and it's fun. The re- I like trolling because fishing teasers is fun. Getting fish behind a teaser, uh, teasing them up to the back of the boat is the most exciting thing I'd say in fishing a blue marlin on a teaser that just, as you've, I'm sure you've seen it a million times, follow it to the back of the boat. The, the teaser's hanging from the outrigger. It's still trying to eat it in the air, yeah. swimming under it. And it's, <laughs> It's just super exciting. Um, you can't beat so that, it. So that's, that's probably my favorite thing for sure is a blue marlin on a teaser. But then, you know, yeah, Costa Rica, you know, you're getting a bunch of sailfish bites as well on a teaser. And it's just fun. It's fun being able to see the bite, to feed the fish 15 feet off the transom. Uh, the art of hooking a fish, free, you know, letting, the, letting them eat it, letting the reel roll, pushing the drag up, you know. It's all, it's all fun. And missing the fish. Because, <laughs> yeah, right. A lot of misses. Uh, missing the fish, having them come back for just the head of the ballyhoo if they're real hungry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Does that count as a miss? No. But <laughs> <laughs> if, you get, if you catch if it. If you get it on the San Cocho, it, it, you did not miss. Exactly. So, um, but yeah, trolling is great. <laughs> yeah. And you can cover quite a bit more ground trolling yes. and the differentiation is we, you know, uh, well, there's a lot of different differences, but when you're kite fishing, you're live baiting. So you touched on this a little bit earlier, Mike, when you said that it's easier, well, relatively it, it all nuances aside that, um, when you have a live mm-hmm. bait and you feed the fish, it's one thing that's very different from when you're trolling and you get a bite on a sailfish and you have to feed the fish. Um, can you yeah. like, I, f- I feel like that's what you said. I've never live bait fed a sailfish. So I don't know. Can you explain mm-hmm. uh, why one would be more complicated or yeah. what the differences would be if they're both equally complicated? So yeah, they both have their challenges. Um, the trolling bit is like the boat's moving ahead. So 
you're holding the reel in free spool with your thumb on the reel and there's pressure on the spool with your thumb because of your, you're holding your bait. And, you know, once again, if you're some, some guys are using bigger chin weights. So down here in Costa Rica, we're fishing like a three quarter ounce chin weight. That's more pressure on your thumb when you're fishing, when you're in free spool waiting for the bite. So if you get a blind bite, you don't see it coming, you know, it's, it goes zero to 60 pretty darn quick which can lead to a lot of backlashes, blow up to the reel, burnt thumbs, all that good stuff. Um, that's what's harder about trolling is the speed of the boat and the fact that you're already have, you're already holding the spool with pressure with your thumb. So when something pulls on it and you don't let go, you don't make that transition soft enough. Mm -hmm. You get a backlash, essentially the reel blow up on you, whatever. And, uh, that's the, that's the hard part about trolling is that, zero to 60 in one second, you know, um, kite fishing. Sneaky. Yeah. A long rigger bite, you know, let's face it. You don't, you don't see them all coming, you know? No. Um, and if to do it, you know, the, you're going to have your best chance holding the rod with the reel and free spool clicker off, you know, if, mm -hmm. if you're able to do that with as many anglers, if you have enough anglers, but, uh, yeah, the boat moving ahead, that transition to, letting the spool roll freely well, after you had your thumb already on it and take your thumb off, it, it can get, it can get dicey pretty quick. Um, with the troll stuff, that's kite fishing, you know, challenging in other ways. Uh, so we're fishing that cork above a 15 foot leader with a lead on the line above the snap swivel. The purpose of the lead in kite fishing is to add weight to your whole thing so that the wind because you have all that fishing line in the air, which the wind is blowing, which is wanting to pull your bait out of the water, basically, you're, you know. Is the so, lead above the cork or below the cork? Uh, so, well, some people put it above. Typically, it's right below the cork. Okay. You'll slide. You know, you got a bimini twist. You'll put a, a, a solid stainless ring, which is what goes in the clip, the ring. Then you got your cork. Then you got your weight. And then the weight, the amount of weight is based upon how much wind you have those days. Uh but that's a whole nother factor in, so you're, you know, you're kite fishing, you're sitting still, essentially you're drifting, you're bumping into the, into the wind, into the waves or whatever you're doing. But you know, you get a bite, you see your cork start to walk off or dot, you know, something funky is going on. You're getting a bite. You can't just dump it because you'll drop the weight on the fish's head. Um, it's not the same as trolling in that, you know, if you go to like a full free spool, you're going to drop that weight in the water and then the fish is definitely going to feel that going on. And so yeah. kite fishing a lot, we have fish that they come up jumping. So you're getting a bite, you're doing everything perfect. You're, you're, you're a little bit of thumb, just minimal to let it, let the fish walk off and not feel any different pressure you know, you're trying to do. Oftentimes they come up jumping, uh, which is the challenge, which is where things go wrong typically. Uh, it's, it's, it's a cause of panic for a lot of people. You know, what do I do now? The fish is jumping all over the place. Your line is still in the clip. And are you, in, you are you the, the big strike? No. So this, this is, this is the question is when do you engage the reel? When do you attempt to pop your clip and get tight to the fish? So, mm -hmm. uh, me personally, if a fish comes up jumping, I actually, at that point, I want to put my weight down in the water because that way the fish is dragging the line and the weight behind it. If it's jumping, that line is always going to be coming out down the body of the fish behind it. And you're putting, that and it's dragging sense. belly in the water. Yeah. So if, if you try, if you have a fish jumping in the air and you try to pop your clip, you're pulling on it from above. And that's usually when you'll pull the hook out or pull the bait out. You know, I think, I think when they come up jumping, they already, I think they got stung with the hook. I think the hook point has, has stung them. It might not be all the way through the barb or through the corner, but they're stung. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're jumping like crazy. And at that point, you know, I've been, I've been doing a little more angling this year than ever before, actually. And, uh, um, you know, I will wait until the fish settles down before attempting to pop out of the clip and get tight to the fish off the rod. You want to, you want, it's all angles, essentially. It's all That's angles. That's so interesting. And yeah, you don't want to pull, you know, up or pull, you know, you want the fish to be swimming away from you 
down in the water. You want to get that low angle on on the, on coming tight and letting that circle hook find its home. So because uh, like because when you're trolling, if you get bit and you're feeding your fish and your fish comes up jumping before you mm-hmm. engage the strike the drag. Yep. More often than not, you're going to lose the fish. You're not going to catch it. You have to yeah. get your, your rod tip down, keep that yep. line in the water as much as possible, which is exactly same premise. the same principle you just said. So I love that. I love that. Yeah. makes total sense. But what a... How interesting, you know, thinking about it with the with the line up in this in the in the air in the sky with the kite right. still because it's yep. still in the clip when you get eaten, Correct. and yep. then um, with that weight, man, that was cool. Angles. I'm really, yeah. yeah. And then you have the I'm weight really too. Like I was saying, that. it's 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 neat. It's all physics. It's all geometry. Um, and once again, you have the weight on your kite line, which is totally different than trolling. Uh, you know, if that fish is jumping a hundred miles an hour. He's towing that weight and all that belly of the line through the water. People don't realize, like, you got to back off your drag. It's, there's a lot more force and pressure down there near the hook on the leader than most people probably recognize when that fish is, you know, going 60 miles an hour through the water, you know, so. Yeah, uh, and especially, like, the more the more line you have in the water, the more pressure More belly, is. more drag, yep. Depending on if it's a windy day, you have ounce and a half of lead instead of a half ounce, you know, that's a bigger yeah, that's a lot. egg sinker. That's more drag in the water. Um, so this is where the angling skill would come into play as far as not breaking fish off or, or pulling hooks and stuff like that, pulling the bait out of their mouth. Um, Man, that's cool. Yeah. Man, time has flown by. I was, I was, did not realize we've already been talking for about an hour. Um, yeah. I really want to touch on, you mentioned teaser fishing. And um, that it's your favorite to I, – my personal favorite is blue marlin bait and switch, right? I love having Absolutely. teasers, no hooks in the water, two dredges in the water, which can be considered – some people call them teasers as well, sub, mm-hmm. submerged teasers. And, um, and then to pitch a baited – like a hooked bait out to the marlin after you take the teaser away. Can you um, – I know that – I mean, fire tails is one of my favorite – artificial dredge baits if not the number one to me on our operation we had at um in the mag season this last year we had a tinker dredge tinker mackerel Mm -hmm. dredge from your new fire tail strips and absolutely loved that thing it was so rad can you tell our listeners a little bit about your fire tails project because i want to hear all about it thank you very much so i i i'm also uh a mate i've been a mate for 20 years on private sport fish boats uh captain as well. However, I've only had a couple, I've stuck with my jobs. I've had great jobs, worked for great captains and I've had longevity in my jobs, uh, which is still a mate. However, uh, you know, I like to, I like to work efficiently and smartly. Uh, we would, we used to go to Isla Mujeres fishing for sailfish. And that was my first real, exp- I, you know, I did all the other travels with the ship and all that down in the Pacific. I never, I never knew about dredge fishing. Um, you know, I wish I could go back with what I know now, honestly. However, uh, yeah, so I get down there to Mexico and I, I get to learn this stuff. And, you know, a lot of people think, you know, if you have all mullet on your dredge, you're going to do better, right? So, or all ballyhoo dredge, whatever, natural dredge equals better fishing. I, I, I learn that's not the case, in my opinion, okay? It's, it's uh, being in the right place presenting your baits on the right angle, you know, tacks with the sea, all those sort of things, being in the right place, in my opinion, are far more important than what you have on your dredge. And even your hook baits are far more important as far as how they're presenting and swimming. So anyhow, we used to fish a ton, uh, rig a bunch of bait, and, you know, we would fish many days in a row. After fishing, I'd have to have dinner on a boat. It never ended. It was long hours. No, and it never ends. We were fishing, uh, yeah, back then there was rubber shads, which are, you know, they look great. They work great. Uh, but durability wise, like, you know, they get a bite, the tail rip off. And mm-hmm. so people started using the mud flaps, which once again, very cool. Uh, I personally. The, the mud flaps are essentially, for the listener that doesn't know, it's um, a tuna silhouette. So it looks like correct. a tuna swimming from, be- from below if a marlin looks right. like it. Yep. They got the pectoral fins, which is great. You know, you got a great silhouette. Um, however, I like action. I like, I feel like, especially if you're going to go under the water, 
actions is going to help you. Um, you know, if you, if you're pulling something on the surface, you know, a marlin lure, something that bubbles, makes smoke, it's easier to trick a fish when they're looking up at something, but when they can size something up from next to it underwater, you know, I, I, I personally want my baits to wiggle. Um, so anyway, I started thinking outside the box, well, thinking hold of on, how hold I can on. make. Pause real quick. Pause real quick. Yep. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but I want to make sure that the listener knows a dredge is essentially, it's, it's pulled underwater, a couple feet mm-hmm. underwater, and it's designed to simulate a school of bait. And these fish, these billfish specifically, they're visual feeders, and they really like to go after, just like all things in the wild, they'll go after the weakest link. So if you Mm -hmm. see a school of bait swimming, and then you see one bait swimming behind it, aka a hooked ballyhoo, that fish is more likely to go off of the flat line, the hooked ballyhoo, and feed off of there, right? Which is attached to a fishing rod. And hopefully an angler holding the reel, like we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. So that's what these dredges are. So uh, go on, Mike. You started thinking. Yeah, so, you know, uh, uh, your boat, obviously, is is not supposed to be out there in in a natural environment. It's a man-made thing, giant boat, propellers spinning. uh, Making a bunch of fish will swim right up to the back of a boat, right? I mean, it's they're curious. But that the boat is the biggest teaser is what I'm saying. And then the next thing they'll see, hopefully, are the dredges, which are closest to the boat in the in the wash there, outside the wash. But uh, yeah, it's a you're, we're mimicking a school of bait, and you know, if you want to have thirty six baits on your dredge, that's a heck of a lot of work. It's a heck of a lot of money in mullet or ballyhoo that ultimately don't even last all day per se. You know, you might even have to change them, and it's a ton of work, which is okay. But you know, sometimes if you got to fish twelve days in a row. You know, there, there's, brutal. there's, there's different influences. It's a lot of work you know? and it's a lot of money. So we would mix in artificials and, uh, you know, I just got to thinking there's, there's gotta be a better way than existing products that are available. So I just, you know, started playing around. There was a canvas shop, uh, behind the, where my boat was docked in Fort Lauderdale. And, um, you know, that guy helped me out with like some stitching and sewing and stuff. And yeah, we came up with, uh, fabric fabric strips essentially that uh you know they, they swim very well uh we got color uh they're lightweight um so therefore you know dredge fishing used to be a big pain you'd break you'd break dredges all the time you'd always be fixing broken stuff fixing washed out baits now and the more you remote you are like yeah the harder i mean freezers here yeah nowadays mm-hmm. so now it's, it's just gotten easier and less breakage, less wear and tear on stuff, um, and it's it's making life easier for folks. And you're, and it's you know once again, I'm a believer, and you got to drive over the fish. I think sonar has proven that. That's a whole other you know thing. <laughs> yeah. But uh, <laughs> sonar has proven you got to drive over these fish to get bit, pretty much. Um, anyhow, fire tails are great. Uh, helping. Do you people. have any with you? Yeah, I'm here in my office. You want to show us a couple? That's yeah, absolutely. So. Most recently, I have a great manufacturer made here in the USA. My guys are up there in Ohio doing a great job. And uh, they came to me and they said, Mike, we figured out uh, we can print on the vinyl. And I said, this is what I've been waiting for. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is my second manufacturer. It's what we've um, all been waiting for. <laughs> in, in addition to my, I have, a, I have another job. You know, Fire Tales is kind of taking a back burner. However, it's starting to get a little more popular, and, and now that I have this ability to, to print, I got to I got to right away. I got out my paint brushes because I've always messed with like I like art, I like painting, drawing fish. As a kid, I always drew marlins in my school books and stuff. And uh, <laughs> here I am now, able to create my own designs and have them appear on these on these baits. Uh, so it's pretty cool. I'll That's grab so one for cool. you. Yeah, yeah. it's uh. I mean, our operation, we've been using uh, fire tails on our dredges, either both dredges or definitely at least one dredge since I want to say 2018, uh, maybe nice. earlier. But I do remember our first time in mags, we had a white fire tails dredge and I have GoPro GoPro footage from that, that dredge of a, of a stripey that just, yes. he won't leave. He won't leave. I it. remember He's just slurping on him. That's <laughs> awesome. No, it's, it's great to... Uh... I've been at it. Sorry, I'm grabbing my stuff here. I've been at it for, it's been about 10 years. Um, 10 years I've been working at this, you know, and the original design was 
bulky and you know I, I learned nothing nothing you know no, nothing happens overnight ultimately and uh no. so anyway we got the the printed ones now um oh my you know, gosh this is the tinker mackerel so, much. Mm-hmm. so I, I just you know based upon my experiences in, in the ocean and all that i base these on trying to make it look as real as possible so we got so different show species us how you, we got a mahi, um, mahi you put mahi. a weight in there yep yep this sort of we can demonstrate that as well, but just a couple more. There's a bonita. We catch a lot of those. Looks a... so good. And then most recently, I had a, I had a customer from California say, Mike, have you thought about a squid? Uh, actually, I had, but this was before I was, it was before I had the printing ability and I was going to like cut fringes in the back of it. It looked kind of silly. I abandoned the idea. So now that I could paint and print, this guy said, how about a squid? And I said, all right. And I ended up uh, whipping up a few. Those are paint sick. patterns and this That's, is a that squid. one's currently sold out on your website right uh yes yes yeah we're flying through these things because uh, everybody wants them because up. the pacific you guys like the pink squid is where it's at on these sailfish yeah it seems to be there is something to do with the the color red which is the first color to disappear in the spectrum underwater uh in fact we used to paint our dredges red and it, and on on when the camera was up close, it would be red. But if you jump into water and watch the dredge go by from 20 feet away, it's, it's essentially invisible, which it works. So I, I'm guessing that's why squids are red is to try to be invisible underwater to predators. Even more camouflaged. Um, My blue water but, spearfish, uh, spearfishing wetsuit's all red. Okay, and, cool. Uh, yeah, it definitely yeah, works. They, they don't um, see me coming. <laughs> let me grab a rig. I'll show you how to rig. But uh, yeah, simplicity... And keeping keeping our lives simple because heck, a mate's job. There's tons of other stuff to always be doing, especially if you have you know if you got to sit down at the dinner table with your owners at night or something. You know, mm-hmm. after cooking, long days, and very long afterwards. days, exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, art, there's there's I don't feel there's anything particularly wrong with an artificial dredge. Now, you know, a lot here in South Florida, the Stewart guys, the Fort Pierce guys, they're religious upon their mullets and their bait. And that's okay. You know, uh, in tournaments, all good. Um, however, it doesn't guarantee good fishing by any stretch. You know, you're, you're you still got to drive over them. The fish still have to be there. Uh, a lot anyhow, of teams we... too, they'll have like pre-rigged artificial dredge. They'll have dredge baits ready for the tournament. And that way you can easily turn like change them out and one thing i really yeah. like about these fire tails is they're super easy to change out mm-hmm. minimal drag minimal you know easy to unclip all that so yeah typically we'll just i mean you can people can put stuff in front of them a lot of folks like to use islanders or dusters sea witches whatever um these baits have their own color so i don't really feel like you need that stuff um what i do is i just Take make a little rig, which is just a piece of monofilament with a weight, and that is designed to go up through the through the through the bait. And there's a, a stitch in the nose that this comes out of. Let's see if I can get this here. But uh, that's that's the rig, and that's how we rig these things. It's super easy. Yeah. Anyhow, here it goes. So then you're left with just a little, a little mono loop that'll attach to your dredge, and uh, that's it. Simple, simple and easy. With a little paper clip. Right on the dredge, yep. So, and then that's the other, awesome. the other advantage is to these lightweight, these lightweight strips is that you can put more on your dredge. So, for example, where you might only fish, you know, two per arm in the past, you could put three per arm or even four per arm. You could put droppers. You could make a giant dredge that you can still rip in when a blue marlin shows up on your bridge teaser you can with your you can still rip the dredge in with your 24 volt lp and not hurt anything and not break the dredge and not you know hurt anything basically it's super because light they're so much lighter than comes in easy even they're even lighter than mud flaps and they're um there's less resistance there's less drag and then also you don't want your marlin to get its face all up in the dredge because it gets a good, a big bite out of something artificial or even like a rigged mullet, and it's it's most likely gonna gonna potentially get out of there. Yeah, I mean, you're, we're we're trying to raise these fish up from the deep. I mean, it's once again uh, the boats I fished on. Clearly, it seems like 
you know, even if you don't have a sonar, they'll mark fish on the sounder. I just marked one 100 feet down. You know, they're down there. I got I got videos that show them raising from the depths. And, you know, they hear the boat, the harmonics of the boat, they, the whitewash, whatever. And and hopefully they see that that wiggle of the dredge against the silhouette, against the, the sky, you know, and they and uh, your spread is is your is what uh, attracts them. You know, you got your hook. Like you said, they're looking for that weak link, whether it's the flat line or your squid chain with the chase bait. Um, you know, that's what gets them fired up is is your 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 spread and uh, mimicking, uh, you know, I guess a, a school of bait fish in the ocean running for its life. That's awesome. I really like that you called the boat the first teaser because um, for sure, for sure. Like, I don't know if you, have you ever heard a feeding frenzy underwater? Uh, I I can't say I have. I can't say I have. So loud. It is so loud, you guys. And this, these boat, these boats are making a lot of, of noise and these fish are, responding to it so like mike Mm -hmm. you just said they're coming up from the deep they're like hey something's going on then you got this school of fish next to it they're like okay i see you and then oh look at that a straggler i'm ready i mean if they were that smart they would say this boat's not supposed to be here this isn't right i'm not doing this you know let's face it they're not that smart i think i think the speed once again in trolling i think if you get a fish swimming fast enough they they can't think as clearly perhaps process their thoughts when they get to swim in to match the speed of a, of a boat or a, a fleeing bait. And, mm-hmm. uh, you, you trick them, you know, you trick them basically yeah. with, yeah. with but I, I don't, I think speed thoughts. is speed is a huge factor in, you know, obviously you can't hang this from a kite sitting still and have a fish bite it. It's probably not going to happen. Right. You got to be moving it fast to get it to, to get it to wiggle and, and get this fish we'll to flip sure the switch. It, we'll- We'll make sure to put some uh, dredge footage on this video. If you guys are awesome. listening to this podcast, uh, come check it out on YouTube. We'll, we'll put some dredge footage on here so you guys can really see the way those fire tails look when they're swimming, like Mike said, because it, it they make a lot of noise. They make And by noise, I mean they have a lot of movement, and um, they're, real, they're really enticing for these fish. Mike, I have one last question for you. We need to wrap up, but um, what is it for you that gets you – coming back to the water every single day? Oh, it's definite. you know, I think about this all the time because of how much I've been fishing lately and all the, all the early mornings and the grind, but, uh, it's the life experiences that are, you can't get on the couch. You can't get sitting at home, uh, watching TV. Fishing is, there's, there's all kinds of challenges, all kinds of emotions in, in a single day, a wide variety of, uh, emotional roller coaster things. And, uh, it's living. And, uh, you know, you're out there in away from the rat race. Uh, you know, yeah. What's not to love? You know, it's, it has its moments when, when you're, when you got to go a hundred miles and six to eight foot seas and, you know, you got to wake up at that alarm goes off at two in the morning or whatever, but, uh, you know, it's tough to put a, to put a value on the ride home after a great day of fishing in beautiful weather, a successful day with your friends or buddies. And, and you just had a great day catching fish and you know, that, that's, that's the best. So it's, it's, uh, it's the life experiences and, and the, and the feelings you get from, from all the success and failures, but stuff you and can't, failures. Yeah, stuff you can't, you can't get sitting on the couch. I love it. Sure. Absolutely. 100% because even when you fail out there, you are still learning and you're still mm-hmm. living and you're still feeling yeah. that, freaking drive i love it that's awesome cool mike well thank you so much for joining us today can you You tell our listeners where they can find you if they want to follow more of your adventures or check out these fire tales yeah thank you katie it's a instagram i have the fire tales on instagram it's a little underscore in between f-i-r-e-t-a-i-l-z um there's my sticker but that's the business and uh yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I work full time here in South Florida on a boat uh, and I do some freelance fishing as well. And uh, yeah, Instagram, I guess these days. And I got a Facebook too. It's my name, Mike. Yeah. So. Awesome. 
Thanks so much, Mike. You guys heard it here, KDC Sawyer Podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. If there's any educational content in here that you think somebody else could benefit from, share away. If you're listening on your podcast listening platform, please feel free to leave a review for the KDC Sawyer Podcast. I really, really appreciate you sitting in and listening to us today. As always, don't stop chasing your wild. We'll be seeing you out there.